All right, another podcast from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be a stellar podcast today. We've been sitting and talking for almost an hour before I've even turned the audio on. Uh, right before we get into it, I want to shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit company. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Every veteran faces difficulties when they transition from active duty back to civilian life, and VetLife is there to ease that transition. If you want to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram or Facebook or check out their website at vetlifetoday.org. So without further ado, I want to introduce Gina Lucille. Um, Gina, you know, I feel like quite a few of our fans are going to know you because they follow what we've done in B2 and they follow, you know, our, our athletes as they compete. But for the people that don't know you, I want to take your story all the way back. This is kind of how I like to start podcasts. I don't want to know the woman that sits here today. I first want to know the woman that you once were. So take me all the way back. You know, where were you born and raised? What were you like as a young woman? And then let's slowly start to build to who you are today. Oh, man, James, that is a loaded question. But first and foremost, thank you so much for having us here. Your institution is just absolutely phenomenal. And it it just exceeded my expectation, which was already extremely high. But, um, man, I am a Connecticut girl. I'm a swamp Yankee. People think that Connecticut New Englanders or New Yorkers or, you know, New Hampshire, all the all the news. But um, I grew up in in Connecticut, like running through mud and trying to dig posts for my ponies paddocks and couldn't make it because there's rocks everywhere. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I moved to Kentucky. Um, horses have been a main big factor in my life, my whole life. And, um, when were you, when were you introduced to horses? Ooh. You know, what, where did that passion come from? Did your family have horses? Mm -hmm. How, how did that get introduced to you? So I've always loved ponies. I mean, like any little girl, right. But my mother was an extremely, um, successful equestrian in her younger years and still is actually to this day. She's killing it. Um, so I, my dad bought me a pony, a little Mustang from Nevada, wild out of an auction and I was eight years old so I got my first pony at eight and I let me tell you what that thing was my bicycle and she's still alive she's 31 years old and she trucks my kids around she's like she'll eat the bark off a tree she's amazing so I I got this pony and she was naughty like she would rear up and like I'd fall off of her and <laughs> she would drag me down the down the driveway I'd have to put like a lip chain on her because she would just there's there's Gina getting drugged by Ruby you know <laughs> But um, I would hop off the school bus, hop on Ruby, and my mom, it was new. Like, we didn't really have cell phones. You know, I'm 30. I'll be 31 tomorrow. So I got a cell phone because I was on my pony until 9 o'clock at night in the summertime and wouldn't come home, bareback. You know, just a halter, lead rope, whatever, just running with deer and stuff. <laughs> Just, what an incredible childhood. That's like yeah. something out of a movie. Yeah. Like you oh, actually I, got the pony as a absolutely. child. Your mother's I put her in the house. You yeah. Know? <laughs> your mother's love for something was was passed on you. Mm -hmm. You picked up that same love. You really have kind of like a, a fairy tale beginning of the story. Like how many young girls yeah, like you said, the stereotype is all young girls want like a pony or a right. horse. You had that. That well, is the life that you had. And so it just escalated from there because my dad is a he can he can build and do anything. So he built a 20 stall barn in the back of our house because we had like 20 acres in Connecticut. And um, it was at a plywood two by fours, two by six. It, like, I mean, it was the nicest plywood barn you could have ever had. And then we just accumulated all these horses. So we had 15, 20 horses at one time. And um, out of your mother's love for the horses. For, well, it, it, yeah, my mom kind of stepped away from it because it's such a demanding sport, you know, and the horse show world can be dark, you know, it's a very keep up with the Joneses. And, uh, she was just shy of an Olympic level gymnast too. So she was like, just shy of Grand Prix level, just shy of like gymnast level for Olymp Olympic level. And, um, so she was burnt out. And so when I wanted a pony that like really set in with her, like, Oh gosh, uh, well she, she did it the total opposite way. She almost like, I was begging to be at the shows. I was like, mom, I, I want to show, like, let me show, you know? And, um, she was like, no, you need to just enjoy it. And so that really, um, made me become a horse woman, like a horseman, you know? So like I rubbed my horses, I like took care of them. I cleaned the tack, I cleaned the stalls. I mean, I had no time for, I had no time for boys. I had no time for school almost. I had no time for anything. I just did horses my whole life. And, um, yeah, it just, 
And in a way, that would instill really good personal responsibility, Absolutely. hard work. You have a living being that depends upon you. There's mm-hmm. certain accountability yeah. there. So you you probably gained a ton of characteristics that were really important for your future just by taking care of that pony. Absolutely. For sure. And, and um, I mean, again, we had at that it started with a pony. And then we got horses. You know, my mom had to get a horse. And then my dad had to get a horse. And my brother had to get a horse. And they had a very successful massage therapy school at the time. So my parents have been entrepreneurs. So I've went from having nothing to having everything to having nothing again to building my life back up and having everything again. So, you know, money comes and goes. That's not the root of happiness. The happiness is the people that you have in your life and the the things that you're doing, you know. That was actually the question I was going to ask next, and you answered it, was, you know, you had to have come from either a wealthy or successful family in most cases, because I, at least as stereotypically, I relate people that have horses as people that have money. I mean, it is not a cheap, you know, hobby. It's not (laughs) something that you can get into, you know, if you're not well off. So your parents were entrepreneurs, both of them, or they're Mm -hmm. both successful in the business world. Right. Got it. So you got to see incredible foundations as mm-hmm. a child. You got to see what hard work looks like. Absolutely. You got to see what an entrepreneur looks like. You get to see personal responsibility, mm-hmm. accountability, ups and downs. Like you said, oh we, my gosh. we've seen the good yes. and the bad. Yes. I mean, my dad is an incredibly crafty man, and he's so smart. And, I mean, this man was a uh, Vietnam vet. He flew Hueys and then medivacs. He got crashed down a few times. And, you know, he comes from an Italian background, so he might have transported some, you know, some stuff back in the 80s. Um, You know, he crashed a couple uh, cargo planes in Colombia and stuff. I mean, he's an amazing, like, stole a helicopter. And, like, I mean, the man's amazing. But um, turn all that into, like, a really healthy life. And my mom is just a worker, and she's a saleswoman. But she, um, so I I watched them, oh, man, I've watched their ups and downs for, for 31 years, you know. So as a child, were you in any other sports or was your pretty much full investment and commitment into that current lifestyle lifestyle you're describing? Well, I did gymnastics younger, you know, because my mom. Same as your mom. Right. I did gymnastics. Um, I was very powerful, not very flexible. And um, then she put me in karate. So I was in uh, Shaolin Kempo Karate with uh, Master Valaris. It was like a big institute up in Connecticut. And um, it's kind of cool because for kids, you know, you're competing against Valaris uh, in, like other other groups of Valaris. And so I did like just point striking and I did that from when I was seven, no, six until I was about 13 when I moved. So I loved that. And I just kind of felt like empowered. And it was a good, it was a good culture, like your place here. Um, and then I did soccer. You know, I like soccer. It was very aggressive defense. <laughs> so, uh, but horses was my main thing. I mean, I did a lot of showing. So that took up my, me and the pony uh, went all over the East Coast, all the way to Florida. We competed in classes of like 200. But then I had two thoroughbreds. I never had, I never have had an expensive horse, but I had a talented horse, and it made me a very crafty rider. Like I can, um, I almost have trouble. I had trouble before I started training a barn up in New York, riding uh, expensive, educated horses, because I was. I'm the rider that can get on a horse and kind of make it their idea that they want to do this. And they have, you know, a happy horse will perform. And like any athlete, they're going to, you know, they're going to perform better. So I, uh, yeah, I've always been riding horses that were not the most expensive one. But I was, I was beating the expensive horses, which was making a lot of people, you know, a little disappointed. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship that you have to have between a person and a horse to get that performance. Because I think you're alluding to that right now. And that's a whole dynamic in itself. You almost related it right there just like a fighter, like a happy fighter is going to be more successful. Why? Well, there's bonds of trust there within their systems, with between them and their coach, with trust with for themselves. Like you probably learned a ton about relationship forming or about life just from training and working with horses. Let's talk a little bit about that for the people that are on the outside. Like I have no right. experience with horses, but I can already tell that you're alluding to those factors. Yeah. Well, with a horse, a horse is very honest. Um, they also have layers because they're, you know, at, at when you get a horse, you're going to get a horse that's six years old, seven, maybe eight or ten. And you got to think of that horse's past. So where was that horse born? And it gives me goosebumps because 
you know, I have had horses that were born on my farm and the one that I have, he is the most stoic, amazing creature who would lay down his life for you. And that's kind of how I am. So he's like a lot like me, but you get these horses that have been shuffled around from people to people who, you know, either the person is not a very nice person or negligent, doesn't know. Um, and it, it forms on this horse's personality. So when you get this horse, they're like, okay, who are you? And then you're like, who are you? <laughs> and you build this trust and it's, it's all with your fingertips. It's all in the palms of your hands, like, you know, and, and touching their necks and, and just rubbing on them and, and them just like, like I've had horses just put their heads in my chest and take like the deepest, like soulful breath. And you're just like, yeah, you're home. And that, you know, I, I am a professional jockey. So that, you know, riding racehorses, like when you're on a two-year-old horse, they're all so freaking different. It, it's just like some horses break your heart because they're broken and some horses just lift your spirit up because they're so excited for life. And it's like the most purest moment of like, hey, we're excited. We're going to do this, you know. But horses, they just feel you. Like you can't lie to a horse. You can't lie and, and you can't manipulate like you you can persuade a horse but you can't you can't manipulate them you can't lie to them they know who you are that kind of makes sense because i mean your words are irrelevant it's not your words they're reading the actions and emotions and energies that you're releasing hundred percent your center of gravity is is in the is on a horse right like you have to be centered with them and they feel like if your heart rate goes up so horses actually can detect heart like a heartbeat I want to say four feet away from them. And I, I believe that, I wish we had like a fact checker, but I believe it's four feet away because they're herd animals and they're run, they, they run from, they run, they're run animals, like they run away from danger. So the fact that we've used them in war is just, and for police work is incredible because they're designed to run away from danger. So having that instilled in them, they can feel your heartbeat when you're on them. Like they can feel the pulse in your hands. They can feel anything. And very so then your confidence in them then in turn turns to their confidence in you and there's like a symbiotic relationship Mm -hmm. almost where where you're both on the same wavelength or the same frequency and that's how you maximize the relationship the performance etc oh yeah it sounds like they're incredibly deep psychological animals like there's a lot to them that the average person would not suspect but like working closely with them you've you've witnessed this firsthand like their personalities are drastically different and they're so different oh my gosh Every horse is so different. You have like your little colts who just think they're little badasses and they're, you know, they're they're just playing. You know, they're not trying to hurt you. They're just rearing up and bucking and jumping and they're just having a good time at life. And then you have some fillies that are just so grouchy and they're just, you know, they, they don't like their groom or, you know, the guy, the guy tacking them up is tightening the cinch too tight and it just puts them in a bad – you can see it happen. Like you can just you, – you, you watch your horse get tacked up and you're like – Oh, yep, Molly's not going to be happy today, (laughs) you know? So then when I get her, I've got to, like, loosen up a little bit and just, you know, I just got to pay attention. I think a lot of people just need to start paying attention in life, you know? Yeah, it's a lot of the (laughs) unspoken things. It's like the the horse is not going to articulate to you, hey, this is a little tight and it's made me uncomfortable and now I'm irritable and now I might put you in danger. You have to be able to feel and read body language uh, aura that's coming off them, mm-hmm. energy, how Absolutely. they're normal. And honestly, those skills translate to people. Does. People that can read people well, that can read energies well, that are more likely to avoid worse situations. They're more likely to have a, a better circle around them, more likely. But just because you can do it with a horse does not mean that the same skill oh. is there for a person. So, and you might let your guard down with people, you're, yes. you, whereas you're on your game with your horses. Most, yeah. I mean, I I am on my game with my horses, I got to say. But, like, so there's this one horse, and it's very recent. Um, They called him Angus, and he had won $100,000, and I was going to ride him in his next race, but he had come off, like, a hip injury. So I'm on the track with this horse, and it's his first day back after getting off of his injury. And I just had to jog him one time around the track. And I was like, yeah, all right, I got this. But he's just picture a bull times 10. Like he's, he's, they called him Angus for a reason. He's got a big old head on him, big old neck. You know, I'm riding super short because he's tough. Like he's just pulling on me. And I get around to the clocker stand and he like throws his neck around and pulls the reins down. And he like told me, he's like, I got your number. And I'm like, Ooh, oh my gosh. Like 
that feeling right there, like he could he could do anything to me. So I'm just like, you know, I'm like, all right, bro, I know you got my number. It's cool. Just take care of little Gina, you know, like just take care of me. So I get back. Um, he's like, you can feel this energy. Like he's just so happy to be out, you know, but he also doesn't want to do too much work. Like he's, it's all on him. Like he's so smart. And um, I brought him in the wrong barn and I had to turn him around and take him out to the next barn. And that right there, like, all class went out the window. He was like, done. I gave you everything I could. I can't hold it in. This sucker bronks in the air to the point where, like, three trainers are running at him. And I'm like, I, like, at that point, you can't hold this thing up because it's like holding up a car. Like, the front, you know, his head is, his head weighs twice my body. So, you know, he's just huge. And so you got to let the reins go and you got to let them buck under you. But you have to get out of the saddle because they can't, they're, if, if the saddle hits you, you fly. So I'm like letting him buck through me. And this thing's bronking, like like PBR bronking. And one of the trainers is running. And I was like, no, I got this. I'm like, I got it. I got it. Because if he grabs him, he's going to ruin our rhythm. And I'm like, I'm riding his rhythm, you know. <laughs> so I finally get him bronked into the right barn. And as soon as he gets into his barn, he like stops, snorts, looks around. And he's like, oh, all right. And I'm like. And at that moment, it humbles you. Horses humble you. And I think that's another reason why I just loved, I, I still do, I still itch to go back to the track every day. But um, they just give you a level of just humil, like, you know, humanity. You know, they humble you and make you feel like. No, I think people, even just listening to your story, I think you can understand that, how it's such a dynamic relationship mm -hmm. and how it relates to a lot of the ways that you interact with life and people around you. So to get back on to your story a little bit, when you are in high school, I, I have a good picture of kind of who you are. At that point, you probably have a lot of <clears throat> self-confidence and you probably feel good about yourself because you've done, you come from a successful family, you've done a lot of things that build strength within yourself, you've found accountability. Um, what do you think life has in store for you right outside of high school? Like, did you know what profession you were going to go into? Mm. Were you going to try to chase a dream of yeah. becoming, you know, similar to your mother? Cause like, it sounds like in a way, and I don't mean this, uh, like you're a mini me, mini me of your mom because oh, for sure. her passion, oh, for sure. her passion poured into you. Yes, so I'm now there's much. a, there's a little mini me and it's like, you could chase the same goals as your mother. You could try to be, you said both times your mother was right short of that top. Maybe Gina is the one that becomes the Olympian. Right. Maybe. So there's that pathway laid out in front of you, but then there's also all the randomness of maybe Gina has her own spark. Maybe you have mm -hmm. something that you say, you know, I want to go this direction. What does it look like as you're starting to get out of high school? What did you expect? So what's funny about that is that like the fact that you even picked up on that, like the spark of, you know, so my mom, I always felt kind of, I always felt bad that she never went to the Olympics and I felt bad that she never did her Grand Prix debut because that's a huge accomplishment. So underlining in me was like, I'm going to go to the Grand Prix. Shit. I might even go to the Olympics. I've got some connections. I just need a good horse because it's not horse racing. It's not, it's show jumping. You need a good jumper. You need a good horse. Anybody can hold on. Uh, literally it's proven anybody can hold on so I actually you know my parents being entrepreneurs and being successful business owners you know there's a lot of failure there's a lot of buildup so we moved I went to 12 different schools so I didn't have a very stable like the most stability and I actually talked to a therapist about this he said you know it's not normal for people it's not natural for humans to be alone with horses all the time <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I can see that. So we moved to Kentucky when I was 14, 15. And man, it was like, they were not nice to me, which is fine. I, but it was very tough for me to even, you know, I'm dyslexic. I, I wasn't diagnosed. I, I had trouble learning. The only thing that made me happy was horses. I want to ask a real quick question too. Why 12 times is an incredible amount. Like, I mean, a lot of kids, like I moved, I think I went to five different schools. So I had the same exact experience of you're the loner again. You're the outcast again. You have to reintroduce yourself. And guess what? You make all these bonds and relationships and then it gets ripped from you then again. You're gone. And now you got to start all over again. And yeah. then at a certain point, like, and you might have too, I just shut off. I didn't care about making relationships Absolutely. with the new people because yes. I'm like, I'm not going to go through all this work and putting myself out there to just have it all ripped away from me again. And you kind of, sure. you, you lose a part of that social desire or like need you're like i don't need that i, I don't <laughs> put, put me wherever you want i'm gonna figure it out well but why in the world would you move 12 times that's an incredible amount yeah um well it, we kind of talked about this earlier off the podcast was you know 
uh, the business dealings. So it was like the, a dream would come in, they would push it through, something would fall through, then we had to move again. So it was in Connecticut, but it was, you know, and my like the, the my home that I call my home that I, my dad built the barn. We only lived there for two years. So that was my home. And um, that's what I feel. That's what I call home. But I really, I mean, even when we went to Kentucky, we moved like three or four times. You're a nomad. You're a gypsy. I, You're well, bouncing all over. But that's what, that's so when I left, I actually didn't graduate high school. So I left home and not saying it was toxic. I mean, it was toxic, but whose life isn't toxic? Like there are toxic things you need to learn how to grow and, and, and move on from. I just knew that I couldn't do it in the environment that I was at with my parents because they kind of went through that cycle all the time. Um, and they're successful. Like they're amazing. I, I can't knock them. And they gave me an amazing life and, and I am who I am today because of it. 100%. You want to hear something funny? Yeah. I didn't graduate high school. I had to go and get my degree after. And it's we're, we're the exact same thing. You yes. know what's funny? I was the guy that bounced all over the place. I was the guy that was a loner and had to constantly lose my friends and my structure, my groups, mm -hmm. and my my <clears throat> my comfort. Because you find comfort in your you clique. Do. You find comfort yeah. in your friends. And when you have that ripped from but you. it keeps you in a circle. Like yes. It stops you from growing. Correct. And that's exactly so. where I was going next. I was going to say, but there's actual tremendous benefit to have having to find the strength in you mm -hmm. regardless Being of accountable circumstance. accountable for yourself, right? Yes. It's not, but I need <laughs> my friends. That's how you feel. You feel like, but I need this, I need that. The truth of the universe that was revealed to us and many other people is you don't need any of these things. These are external things. You mm -hmm. need to find strength within yourself. And if you can find strength within yourself and belief within yourself, regardless of circumstance or environment, you can flourish. You can build the best version of yourself. And regardless of setbacks or failures or this and that and the other thing, if you find what you need in here, you're then going to enhance every environment that you go to. And Absolutely. you could build from the ground up anywhere. Yes. So as you're telling the story, the similarities are actually shocking on on our backgrounds and it's funny because we're both go getter mm -hmm. accomplish your dreams oh, no yeah. one can stand in the way type people almost perfectionists yes like like <laughs> exactly the brick wall we were discussing <laughs> Which, every brick new, has this to is line amazing. up <laughs> but that's the idea i think that when you find strength in yourself you're able to say like well then i'm gonna do everything i can to the best of my ability mm -hmm. okay because it matters so your parents have moved you all around you've yes. tried to find you know, uh, a place to just fit in and be comfortable. You've been taken from that. So you go, you take solace in your horses. That's where like Gina yeah. lives, right? Well, then it really went. Um, so I left home at. Wait, I got, we got to talk about the build up for that. So okay. cause, cause right now the podcast we've told is a wonderful beginning. <laughs> Gina's got her pony. Everything is yeah, great. My ponies, I'm, I'm, all, yeah. I'm following the passion that was laid forth by my mother, <laughs> but there's a certain bit of individuality that's screaming inside me. Right. You know, so right now we have a perfect, maybe not perfect, because there's no such thing as perfect, but we have a very, very good origin story. Mm -hmm. Why does that shift? When does that shift? <laughs> then let's talk about that okay. chapter. Oh, boy. Well, actually, so um, at 14, the reason why I left was my horses were stolen from me. Yeah. So my parents leased the property. Um, the guy knew I had nice horses. They were big jumpers. I was jumping them four foot six and they were worth money. So he illegally locked them out of the facility and said that they owed him money, which I can on my daughter's life. My mom has never not paid a bill ever. So took the horses. Um, a couple weeks later, he was in with it in the sheriff actually, cause it was down in Kentucky, like deep, deep, you know? Um, and they had been doing this for a long time. They've been, you know, just wrangling horses so they took my jumpers they sold them and when we came back they were gone so I lost I lost everything I had my pony but I lost my jumpers that I had those were going to be my um my jumpers that were going to get me to like the four foot six like stakes classes not grand prix like maybe a mini pre mini pre is like four six you know not like a meter 40 you know and these suckers were like I got them trained up to that you know. So now this is your first major trauma or life One literally. Of them. Yeah, that was yeah. that was everything got ripped from me. Like I was fine with moving around. I was fine with losing, you know, toys. Well and you had grown you know accustomed I mean? to those things. You yeah, said, Okay, I, was, I can handle that. But my my oh, thing yeah. is don't you dare mess with my yes, horses. And this man stole stole uh three of our horses and he didn't take the warm blood because he was a baby. And which is so weird because Val is was born on my parents farm. Um, his mom taught me how to jump. She was actually Ian Miller. So she was an Olympic level Grand Prix jumper herself. 
And my mom bred her to a Hanoverian stallion out in California so that I could have Val. And I, funny story, I did, I jumped on Val when I was like 12 when he was a baby and I was riding him around the arena because she taught him voice commands and she was like, oh shit, my 12 year old daughter's on a two year old stallion who's not broke, never been ridden. But um, yeah, so he didn't get taken because he was just young, you know, and the guy obviously didn't know what he had. He took the horses that were jumping big and I was training every day and he saw like just athletes, you know, they were like thick and muscular and jump anyway. So yeah, that got, uh, I showed up to the farm and I just like, James, I just, everything. And it's so funny. I, I haven't spoken about this and probably, I don't even think Peyton knows about this. Um, but yeah, the, those horses got taken, never found him again. Oh, and then he starved my main jumper. So he died. Yeah, so two of them got stolen, uh, Wes and Frenchie, and then Louis got, he didn't feed him. He left him in a stall and didn't water him. So you experienced true devastation yeah. at a young age because <clears throat> you've had a pretty decent upbringing. You have passion in your life. You have things that you care about. And now your whole world gets shattered because yeah. that's your world. That's, that's like where my, yeah. you. And Louis was my, my champion jumper. So I had competed. He's a thoroughbred. I bought him for 50, my mom bought him for $1,500. And I had been competing and winning everything on this thing. This horse, so this horse would do incredible things for me. Like I look back and I'm like, I wish I had the videos because I could have died. Like, I mean, my mom, like if my daughters were doing what I was doing on these horses, I couldn't handle it. Like I'm glad Sandy has rose colored glasses sometimes because <laughs> I scared a lot of people. Like we did, there's a, there's a jump, it's a one stride and you jump in. And then you do one stride of a horse's, you know, gait, and then you jump out. This sucker, I run him in there, and I do a bounce. We don't even, we don't even one stride it. This thing lands and just leaps, and we win the class by a hundredth of a second. I win champion out of like two hundred and something people on this fifteen hundred dollar thoroughbred, and I'm like a buck ten, you know, like just ripping it. I mean. Yeah, um, but yeah, he was he was my world. So you've experienced winning. You've experienced oh, yeah. you, you feeling great, and you have this amazing relationship with these animals, and you have all this positive, but now your world gets shattered, and mm-hmm. you experience how bad life can be on yeah. the other side. Someone n- harmed you deeply, which yeah. is going to affect you emotionally. Let's talk about how that period changed you, because it sounds like, like I said, there's a very fairy tale, and, and I don't want to, I don't, when I say like your story was a fairy tale, I'm sure there's tons of difficulties i'm sure sure. there's tons of struggle but But overall overall things were great yes now you get this terrible human being that did something and harmed you majorly and in life that can really put you at a crossroads and then you know that can drastically alter the person that you once were you're never going to be the same gina before that took place so let's talk about that period of your life you know I'm sure there's a lot of anger, resentment, blame, Mm -hmm. mom's fault, this person's fault, this person's fault, especially when you're a child and you can't really frame perspective correctly yet. You're just angry and you're like, ah. Yeah, I'm about 15 years old. I'm going to be, you know. So the dreams before and the dreams after probably change. Mm -hmm. The path before and the path after probably changes. Let's discuss that period the emotions that you went through, the psychological transformations, and then we'll start to build when you're getting it back together. Right. So, of course, I'm, you know, I'm blaming my parents. I'm blaming my mom. That's 100% what I thought was going to happen. Of course. The child goes, it is it's your, your fault. fault. You did this. Like, you you did this. We always have to move. We always lose everything. And then it finally caught up to us where I lost the one thing that is my stability. So what do I do? Well, I pack my shit up and I go to the racetrack and I start riding racehorses. And I, I just, I leave. And I, um. You left home at 14. I left home. Well, 15. it was 15. Yeah. Left home. Left home. Where are you living? <laughs> I stayed in my car for a couple of days and then I found a room to rent from one of the, you know, one of the people at the track. They rent rooms out to people that are flying in from Europe. And so I was like, I got this. Like, I'm just gonna, I got this. I don't need I don't need you. I don't need the pain that I've just gone through. (laughs) I'm an adult. I'm going to suppress it and, you know, yeah. I'm going to push it all down and just keep moving forward. And so I had, I I did pay for homeschooling and then I just, it it came to the point where I paid for it. First of all, my first job on the track was not a rosy one. I was getting on, you know, some cowboy's horses and they wanted to pay me like $150 a week. And I thought that was fine because I'm 15, you know, like you don't know what it costs to be out in the real world. 
And, um, yeah, I mean, these suckers are orangutans. They were rearing up in the stall, never had tack on, never, you know, and I just thought it was normal. The, the amazing Mexican guy, Mario, he, like, showed me how to tie a knot. He's like, oh, senorita, you need to tie a knot like this. And, you know, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Mario, so I'm tying a knot, going out on these horses, and they're bronking and kicking them. And, you know, it, it, was, um, it was a wild ride. He actually, the trainer I rode for was the original rider in Planet of the Apes. He was the main rider. Yep, Mike Crowder. Uh, awesome, awesome cowboy. Um, I mean, he had a great laborer for $150, you know? You're not kidding. He re- <laughs> apparently, he's an intelligent businessman, too. He was like, 150 a week? You're like, yeah. He's like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sign right here. But he was the one guy that I had run into, and he's like, oh, if you ride jumpers, you can ride racehorses. So it was my mo- one ticket into the track. It was my one relationship that I have had built. And so when I went to him, he's like, yeah, come on down, you know? Um, so, but it wasn't, it wasn't long after I was riding there. It was only like two months that, um, someone saw me ride. And of course this was like a janky racetrack. Like this is where like people who shouldn't have horses have horses. And, you know, they saw me and they started putting me on their older horses. I would never broken out of a gate before. So they shoved me in a gate at 16 years old and I break out. My stirrup gets lost. I don't even know what's happening. Like I'm going 45 miles an hour on a horse and I'm, you know, I don't know. And out of a gate, you know, race prepping a, a, a five-year-old, six-year-old who's already prepped. He's had races. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. So um, I survived and got picked up by a trainer who is still to this day like just an OG horseman in my heart and uh Kellen Gorder picked me up and I went to Keeneland and I rode this horse called Cello and he was a Mr. Greeley horse and he was naughty he would but he was he was he was fine he was good with me he was only a baby at the time so I rode for um I rode for them and at that point I went to Keeneland which is the most but besides Santa Anita or sorry Del Mar Saratoga and Keeneland it's one of the most beautiful tracks in the whole entire world. I mean, it is just, it's gorgeous. And um, so much history, too. So I started riding for Kellen, who was training horses for Windstar. And by the time I was 17, going to be 18, yeah, because I was going to be, you know, a legal adult, um, I was riding these Breeder Cup horses, these Derby horses, like horses that went off. Like after they let, like I, the three horses I had on my set list was um, um, Drosselmeyer, which it, they now have a, a race called the Drosselmeyer. Endorsement, who is one, one of the one of the leading stallions, was one of the leading stallions at, at Windstar. They have so many now. Um, Super Saver, who won the Derby with Calvin Burrell. And who else? I mean, um, my list of horses goes on and on and and on, and I'm just so blessed because God had a plan. He was like, I got you, just, and and at the time of age, like, you don't really, you're not, you're just going with the flow of life. So, I, I, and I, and I wasn't a drinker. I didn't do drugs. I've actually never done a drug in my life. I didn't, I didn't really drink because my mom drank, you know, she was like, like to drink the wine and everything, and I thought she was an alcoholic, but I mean, really, she's just a normal, you know businesswoman drinking and um so I just uh, I didn't want that on on my on my on my record you know so I always showed up and then because I was little I um, became a breeze rider so I started prepping these horses so not only did I ride all these horses for you know horses that were about to you know go to other trainers to go to the Derby Kentucky um Breeders Cup and <clears throat> I started breezing horses for like Wayne Catalano and riding um Coleport who was in the Breeders Cup and oh I was the first person to ever work a half a mile on the dirt new dirt track at Keeneland because they wanted Breeders Cup but it was poly track so they had to redo the whole surface so I was the first person to breeze a half a mile on Bourbon Courage who is was in the Breeders Cup I uh, Windstar Farm put in a couple million dollars worth of in a track, and I was the first jockey to go there. They hired me to come out there and breeze horses for the Blood Horse, um, just because I I showed up and I did a great job. I was just very prideful in my work, but my work was the horses. 
So it sounds like in parts Such of your story, age. I was going to say some like ignorance to some of maybe the dangers or the situation oh, and yes. then, like, or like delusional confidence or like, yeah, sir, just throw <laughs> me in there. Like it actually paid off in your advantage. And For a lot, sure. I faked it till I made it. Yeah. A lot of the times being young and you just have this overwhelming sense of confidence can not only, I mean, it can put you in danger, but it can allow you to do some incredible things that I most, had good pe- horses under most me. people's fears might keep them from, because if yes. they, if you were further along, like, like you said earlier, Earlier in the podcast, you said if I saw my daughter doing the things that I was doing, I'd be like, absolutely not. No way you could end up killed. <clears throat> but your almost ignorance was good for you in that period of life because it allowed you to just you were a go getter. You're 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 listing a lot of these things that it's shocking to yourself now that like I can't believe I could do that. I know. You know, because I was just willing to go for it. At what point, like um, so I'm starting to hear some success in the way that like you're enjoying your life again. You're you're on the cutting edge of bigger things now oh, you're yeah. not at some beaten down little track you're really kind of like big, i'm with the, the big the boys big time yeah. exactly so there's a lot of pride i'm sure that comes with that oh, like yes. yeah i'm right alongside yes. these these champions yes. and then everyone's telling me you know i should i should ride races and i'm like well well shit i should ride races you know what i mean like i'm like yeah i love to go fast i'm little i can you know i can make weight and um oh man you know being a young girl like real like you know, boys want to date you, you know, so I got into a couple of relationships that uh, stunted my growth, but also helped me grow. And, you know, I mean, I could have had a, a probably a better career uh, with horses, but I could have gone injured, too, because I look back on certain, you know, things that I have left and I wasn't in certain races and people have gotten paralyzed or died. And I'm like, well, I mean, it could have been me. You know, I mean, I've broken my foot. I broke my knee really bad, which set me back. I was breaking babies. So I was riding like 23 horses a day. So I'd get up at um, 545, be on my first horse by six. Not really a morning person, but the track mate, you have to be a morning person. So yeah, I was, I started my job at six and I would ride about eight to 10 in the morning at the racetrack. And then I would go to the farms and break about another 10, 15 horses. So the most, well, actually the most I ever rode was like 25, 25 in a day, 23. Yeah. I mean, a- after 16, you kind of lose track. Yeah. 100%. So now that you start doing better, feeling better, you're probably not holding as much of the anger. I mean, it might still be there because you've, like you said, you kind of just repressed it. You pushed it away. Do you start to rebuild the relationship with your parents at some point or does this happen way later in your story? Because it sounds like you're now doing some things that your mom would actually be very proud about. You're kind of on the cutting edge. You're right there with the big boys. You're in the sport that she was incredibly passionate about. That little girl that got her first pony is now out there you know, racing on these horses and doing some incredible things. I imagine I see a bond reforming, or does that not happen until later on in life? Yes, we did, but I was still super distant. You know, I, I think I was learning boundaries at a young age, like, I, but without even knowing what boundaries. I mean, now we have our, our phones, and, like, all this information is everywhere. So I always try to be a better me every day. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes I'm stagnant. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I, I was setting, I did set boundaries with them. I was, you know, I was fine on my own. So of course I always loved to have them around and they were, um, and, and she sell, you know, they sell horses. So they was sold race horses that were retired and gives, I mean, she's, they've done an incredible job. They really have. Um, so yeah, I did have a little bit of relationship, but I was so, I was so busy, James. I was working until, I mean, I would get off my last horse and then hit the gym. You know, because I want to be a jockey, so I got to be fit. I mean, you know, now I know it's just a horse. Like, you got to get on a good horse, you know. Now, to this day, are you still heavily involved in the in that same exact area? Like, are you still racing horses? Are you still a jockey? Or have you stepped away from that at this point in time? At this point in time, you know, I've been focusing so much on the broadcasting because I love sports. And I love, I did acting and modeling. I did modeling since I was 18, 17 years old. And I did acting out in California. I did some, I got offered some movie roles. And it's just, that wasn't my, it's a very dark industry. And some people are doing things that I just couldn't look at myself in the mirror to just know that I, you know, I was a hot ticket too. I was like, you know, I ride $10 million worth of racehorses in five hours in the morning. So if you think I'm going to do something for a $7 million film, like 
get, you know, go kick rocks. Well, I want to talk about that really quickly. And then I want to get to your broadcast side because I think we can really dig into that. And yeah. I want to talk about B2 and what you're doing now. And you guys are exploding and there's so it's much. Amazing. And we got the fights this weekend and you're telling me it's going to be the best broadcast ever. So there's so much I want to get to. But from the woman riding horses and that one particular sphere of your life where it sounds like you're super passionate, you're in an awesome environment, there's a lot going on. You said there's a Hollywood acting and modeling thing that comes in. Where does that come into play? You moved to California to pursue this? So, yes. When I was um, – so I finally started my racing career um, in between having – I went up to New York, and I did ride those Grand Prix horses. And I was – I got married because I was searching for a family. I wanted – you know, I – you know, married some poor schmuck and, you know, like he was, I just, I had the reins and he just sat in the passenger seat basically for, you know, anyways. So I got up to, um, and honestly, you're probably super inexperienced in what real relationships of are course. and what you really want yes. out of a companion because like your whole world was horses. You of knew course. it. You I could tell know. me perfectly what you want out of a horse, what you want out of a jumper, what you want out of a racer. But if I, at that point in time, it was like, Gina, describe what you <laughs> need in an ideal man. That's a partner for you. You probably were incredibly limited in your knowledge of what you wanted so but you did it because like we're told that you're supposed to grow up get married have a family yes you know so you go into that it's not that shocking to me so I asked this guy to marry me in Florida and of course he says yes after knowing him for like three months time out you (laughs) took the reins on this male three months in and you said you're I'm asking you to marry me this happened yes and that broken horse said no I'm I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating I'm joking (laughs) okay but he was just like Yes, I will marry you. Three months into dating, you asked him. You flat out said, like, you're my guy. Yeah. And then you guys just rode off into the sunset. At what point, (laughs) obviously I'm I'm putting a little bit of humor into this. Yeah, no, it's great. At what point do you start to realize, like, wait a second. Like, maybe Um, this isn't the thing for me or... When he just couldn't stop drinking. I was like, oh my God, this guy's an alcoholic. And he is um, insecure. Shocking, in three months you didn't know everything about him, Gina. (laughs) Shocking. (laughs) Imagine that realization. I know, I know. Um, but I'm 20. No, I get it. I'm like it. 22. A hundred percent. You're so young. You're naive to mm-hmm. relationships. Oh, and we're and- in Florida, baby. Like Gulfstream. We're riding horses and like you, you saw know, one bug. sunset. You related that done. to a movie, and you're yes. like, "That's it." That, Princess Bride. Th- this done. is where we're I do off. it. I know you're supposed to propose <laughs> to me, but let's just expedite this process. I'm going to propose to you. Yes. And and luckily, my whole life, I have really learned how to turn it down. I've I've toned it down, and I, I'm patient. I'm an Aries, so like, you know, I mean, my birthday's tomorrow, so I'm very fiery and energetic. And anyway, so yeah, so I marry this guy. We go to, uh, we go to Connecticut because I'm going to train jumpers for Jane Dow at Westbrook Hunt Club at this multi-million dollar facility. You're untouchable at this point in yeah. your mind. You're like, I'm oh. going to do what I want to do. Nobody can get my way. Absolutely. You're my husband now. Come with me. <laughs> you are my husband now. Yes. We're moving here. Yes. The- and he was fine. Well, he rode too. So he was actually a very pretty rider too, um, but he was very scared. That's why he drank. You know, he had to ride bad horses. And when you're a good rider, you don't ride good horses. You ride bad horses. So we go to Connecticut, but the drinking took over, and I had a lot – I was getting a lot of success, and I think that was bothering him. So he got in a fight with the owners, and I'm very loyal. So I was like, well, if my husband can't be here, then I can't be here. So left and went back to Kentucky, started racing, and we got a divorce because – I'm just an entrepreneur, dreamer. I'm always, there's always, if an idea gets thrown at me, I kind of percolate on it and then I either go for it, but it's exhausting for people. And I know that. I know that now. And especially that type of human being to be with someone else that has a lot of insecurity or a lot of brokenness to them. Not, It's right. not that they're bad people, but if you're like a broken person or you have a lot of insecurities or you're someone that has so much that work that you have to do within themselves and you're with this bold, passionate, go-getter, yes. it almost a lot of times can actually make it harder for you to grow because like you have this unbelievable shining light that just makes your shadow seem more extreme. Absolutely. This light is casting an extreme shadow so next to you that you're going like, Look at my inadequacies. Look at how I am falling right. short of who I should be. And look at this person that's crushing it. And the amount of people that really can just look at someone that's crushing it and take inspiration from that and then start crushing themselves, it's very limited. Usually they have to go through like their own healing process that's very slow. And generally people like us, especially at a younger state are, and when we lack maturity, we're not really good at building that person as your companion yet. Because it's like, I'm stepping my shit up. Right. Why you don't you do it? Yes. Shit. 
one hundred percent not realizing like that person. It, it there's a softer approach. Poor thing. There's a exactly looking back, you can absolutely fully mean the words like poor thing. Like mm-hmm. like I was not what they needed to become their best. Absolutely, and that wasn't my intention. Right, but I couldn't tone down right. my volume yeah. for them. And I did find myself at points where I would turn down that shine. To make other people comfortable. You can't do you, that. Yeah. That is like a universal truth. Anyone listening to this podcast, if you have to turn down your passion or who you are or your convictions or- You need to turn up who's you, who you're around. 100%. You, yeah. you need to change your environment. And if, if people want to <clears throat> try to drag you down, you have to change that. And you have to find people that want to pull you up. And most of my people in life, I have friends that are incredibly successful. They want to see success in others. That is like yes. the that is the theme of people thriving, that are doing man. well. Man, I love if it. If you're thriving, yes. you want other Everybody, people. Everybody, you thriving. want the community to be thriving. You know, and and you can. Okay, so what I there's a saying that says you can ch- you can't change the crowd you're around, but you can change the crowd you're around. And it's like hundred percent, absolutely. You can't directly change all of these people, but you can get to a new crowd, and that's still changing the exact same crowd. And that's why I had boundaries when I was younger with my parents because I I saw like their amazing sides, but then I also saw what they had to work on, and they hadn't yet. And I didn't. I wanted to just. I always want to be better. Like I just want to be better. I'm like I just want to be better. I actually want to talk about something very quick that I think is so important for people that are inspired by your story or my story or other entrepreneurs or other passionate people. Listen to these words super carefully. Be selfish when you're young. And the reason I'm using be selfish, our society has a negative connotation for the word selfish. Selfish towards your passion, towards what brings out your light, towards what makes you the best version of yourself that's going to yield the best mother, the best friend, the best leader, the best... You need to bring that person to life. And so many people are terrified of being classified as selfish. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they dim any quality within themselves that make other people feel insecure. Exactly. Makes them feel comfortable. They're like, you know what? I need to tone myself way down because then I'll just fit in more. I'm telling you right now, do the exact opposite of that. If your selfishness is harming people and doing damage, well, then you have to monitor. Tone it down. Exactly. Yeah. You have to monitor those parts. <clears throat> but don't ever look at the word, like self-love and giving the best to yourself first. That is a personal responsibility that every single person should take because if you bring out the best in you, you're going to influence the world so Absolutely. much. It's like your foundation to the house. You cannot build a house and, and put lights on in the house if your foundation is cracked. So where I'm relating this to the story is at that stage in life, Gina, you had to pour 100% in yourself and some mm-hmm. people couldn't handle the light that was radiating right. off that. And you weren't at a place because I feel like leaders, when they go through their journey, later on, one you've when you've brought out the best in yourself and greatness within yourself, you then can have grace for others. And you can build people that like, if you, as you sit here today, were in a relationship with that former man, you could bring greatness out of him much better than the woman that existed at that period of time. Absolutely. But you had to go through your journey first. Right. You had to become the Gina that you're meant to be to then be able to even understand Mm -hmm. what that person is struggling with versus just like, why are you drinking? You suck when you do that, you know, et cetera. Like, why, why are you not working? I'm working three jobs and you're, you can't have one. Yes. You can't keep one. Now you and I sit down today and we could say you know what psychologically he was probably dealing with a lot of things he had a lot of issues that he had to work through he had he needed maybe to see a therapist maybe to have this maybe a different friend group to support him maybe but like at that stage in life it's just kind of like yo what are you doing lazy no get up yep so we learn grace with time but what i wanted to point out was please young people especially dreamers Go dream. Dream. And you know, the best time to do it, Mark Cuban just said this on a podcast. He was like, fail in your 20s. Fail in your 20s. If you're broke, you have nothing to lose. You have no children, no no, no finances, nothing. If you want to hop in that van and go travel the world, hop in that van and go travel the world. And there's nothing you cannot do. The can't is not like, yeah, you can choose to not do it, but you can, you know, you can make money. Doing anything. I have one of my girl, well, this girl I know, she's like, Gina, I've never met anyone who just makes her own job. I've always made my own job. Like, I want to be a professional mermaid. So I'm going to go buy a couple mermaid tails, be a little mermaid for my girl's birthday party and rent out my tails. You know what I mean? Like, do, just do it. If you want it, there's a way to do it. And life is like that. Life <laughs> will get a mermaid find tail. The, the life will find a way 
if you find a way. Yes. Like if you're like, this is what I'm yes. going to do. Eventually the universe just kind of steps to the side. They're like, this okay. person's unstoppable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're going to do what they want to do. So we're going to let them. And you know what? And that's where people are like, oh my God, I can't believe you're doing that. Well, it's because they believed they could do yeah. that. Yeah. And that's how they get there. So now, okay. so let's, let's get California. back on track to the story. You're in California. Yep. You're in a vastly different career Ooh, environment surrounding environment. California and, is a world like, you know, you, you head out there sometimes. It, it's just a different, different lifestyle. So now fast forward, I'm racing. I get an, a, an opportunity to race out in California. I get lied to. So I'm working like 300 horses for free. I get one ride. I get put on this horse with a nine out of 10 cracked shin that is just almost killed me and the owner I, I race him he's like seven to five so he's like hot ticket shot you know Gina's bug rider apprentice rider gonna ride this horse and I just came from Indiana Grand where I was like I left the week I left my horses all made like about ten thousand dollars no no sorry I would have made ten thousand dollars in one week at like 23 years old but I was like I'm on to bigger better things I'm going to California this is like the big you know I'm, I'm, it's my shot because I mean Indiana is amazing and it like just has a place in my heart but it's not California you know and I've always said I wanted to go out there so I get on this like this horse at Del Mar and I the thing just doesn't can't run I mean he really can't couldn't run come to find out um my ex was the assistant at the barn and they had blocked the horse's leg so that he couldn't feel anything after I breezed him the day before or you know a couple of days prior the horse couldn't walk he was four-legged lame the owner didn't know it he wanted to give me a shot wonderful person oh I just I love the owners of those those horses and um yeah the thing had a nine out of ten correction poor I mean and that's the ugliest that's the ugly truth of horse racing there is a lot of bad you know but there's a lot of great so uh the horse gets claimed uh the trainer that claims and tells me the next day he's like you have a guardian angel looking out for you and I'm like what do you mean he's like that horse cannot walk like he almost like he should have he should have broke his leg so oh man you know at like 24 years old you're like how many times do I have to dodge danger you know and I at like I'm I'm expendable. You know, at this point <clears throat> I'm I'm realizing more in the racing community and in life that you are just disposable to people. And you really have to be true to yourself, even more so. So I still stick it out. Um, then I started getting more involved with the movies and extra like doing T V extra work and stuff and I got um yeah, I got offered some movie roles. But I Oh, man, it's it's that just wasn't for me. And on in the back of my mind, my dad worked for a um sports he flew helicopters for like ESPN and stuff with one of his buddies. And his buddy, uh Gordon, who is just he's awesome. He is like always telling me you need to you need to be doing sports broadcasting, you need to be broadcasting or doing something on TV. Like this is what you need to do. Um but it wasn't the movies. So I, I just, and I still at this point didn't know because I'm just all about racing. I mean, I was running 14 miles up the mountain. I was working out twice a day. I mean, I was doing two hot yoga classes a day. I was riding 10 horses. Um, and I was just, yeah, running 10. I either did six or 14 miles a day, just running. And I was like, just running away from my feelings. <laughs> yeah. So then you're in this new world and you start to quickly realize like this isn't the route that I want to take. It sounds like you, you came to that realization yeah. pretty quick in relative perspective. You started being like, this isn't it for me. Gordon's telling me sports broadcasting. Yeah. When do you make your first jump into any type of broadcasting or television or like in front of the camera role? So it took a little while because I left California, came back to Kentucky. I met the father of my children and then boom, I got hit with... A whirlwind of just just things happening in my life between my parents and I having a huge uh, dispute and um, the father of my children. Like I, I you know, I I had I, I got pregnant and um, I, I, you know, I was like, I'm going to do this housewife thing. Right. Because that's like what what society says you're supposed to do It's like, you know have a kid, be a housewife, you know, work a little bit. I'm just such an entrepreneur. Um, and 
you know, after I had Rory, my young, my oldest, um, the father of the children, he's very abusive. So, but it didn't happen until, like, he showed signs of it, but it didn't really escalate until after I had the baby. And he felt inadequate as, as a father or as a person. And um, I just, one day I, I said to him, if you're not happy with your life, change it. Like I went back to riding, we couldn't pay the bills and that was fine. So I just was like, well, let me put my big girl pants on and go to work. Like, that's just what we do. We just, we work. I'm, I'm a workhorse. My mom, I call my mom the old bay mare because you could shoot her knees out and she's still going to pull the cart. And I'm her little chestnut thing, like just full of fire. You're not going to tell me, you know, you're not going to tell me what not to do or to do. I mean, well, I'm, I'm much more mellow, but I was just very fiery, you know. Um, and he picked me up. By, I was changing Rory. He picked me up by my neck, slammed me on the ground, knocked me out. And I woke up. Well, I shot my rooster because that's sane, you know. And I got up and I was like, you know, I have to leave now. Like, that's it. And so I left. I went to Kentucky uh, or went back to Lexington because we were living two hours away and started living with my friend Nicole and her daughter. And, you know, I tried to make it work with the dad because I don't want a baby to go without a dad. You know, I'm not like a vindictive woman or mother who's like, I'm going to keep this kid from you. I'm like, no, you got to have a a family, you know? Excuse me. So. Um, tried to make it work. I ended up getting pregnant again. And same guy, same guy. So you were still not with him, right? I was entering to some degree. To some degree, um, it only takes one time, James. Yeah, only and I and I joke because it's like a full heat. Like after a mare has a foal, you bring up, you know, you bring him back to the breeding shed to get him pregnant on that full heat. And I, it just, it just happened. And at the time, I was terrified because. I'm taking care of an infant all on my own and I have no relationship with my parents because we did not speak for three years after our dispute. And so I have nobody, but I'm like almost empowered in a way because I'm like, I don't need anybody. I'll I've make got, it on my own. I've got this little baby. She's my tribe and it's given me my even more of a why, you know, um, I'm sad that I didn't get to, uh, enjoy those tiny infant years like those days with her because I was hustling. Like, so I'd bring Rory to the racetrack. She had a setup in the tack room and I would get, or or I had a nanny, like I had a babysitter for $20 a day, which was amazing. And I brought her to there at five in the morning or five 30. I'd drop her off. She'd be sleeping. I would go and work until 10, pick her up, uh, bring her to the tack room with a TV or something. She would sleep because she was a baby. Um, I was like breastfeeding at the time and I was riding. So I was riding, again, I was up to riding uh, 16 horses, 17 horses a day, just, and, and I was making it. And then I fell onto this farm because I started selling a couple thoroughbreds here and there to make, you know, four or $5,000 extra a month to put forward to the next month because I'm living day to day, you know. And formula at the time because I was working so hard, like I can't breastfeed because you, like, you just dry up. So I'm buying this Enfamil, which is like $46 every two or three days. And then I find out I'm pregnant. So I'm like, shit, you know, um, I get, a, I, I, I got a barn full of 30 clients of show jumpers. So I'm training, I'm teaching lessons and putting on horse shows, riding at the racetrack while I'm pregnant. You're just doing everything you can. Everything to get by. I Anything can. Anything and everything. And give it, trying to give Rory, like, I'm like, all right, I understand my job is dangerous, but I have no other way of supporting us. And what I thought of, like, okay, this baby's alive. As, as I don't know if this sounds terrible, but, I mean, it kind of does in my mind. Like, you're alive, but I got to take care of you. You're not here yet, but you will be, and, and I have to stay safe. So I'm putting it, I'm putting it in God's hands. Like, and so I was riding, um, I rode racehorses up until I was like seven, eight months pregnant with Alara. <clears throat> oh yeah. I got pictures and I'm actually not just riding racehorses. I am prepping two year old breeze up sale horses at Keeneland. Can you, can you listen to the words that you're saying now and reflect back to that young... Imagine if your daughter This was, was only a couple years ago. I mean, my kids are two and three. I, I still... I'm like... You're like, what in the world was I doing? Oh, yeah. Because it is extreme risk. One fall sure. at an eight oh, month when pregnant, you, you lose that child. For sure. For sure. So I'm in the gate, actually, with my friend James, Corey Owen, um, and he's a jockey. And so... 
Uh, and, and it's kind of cold out too. So like I've got a jacket on, but like you couldn't tell I was pregnant. Like I looked the same. I just had this big old bump, you know, and I'm in the gate and I'm like on this two year old and I grab up the main. I look over and I was like, Hey James, you guess how, how far along I am? He's like, what? I said, yeah, I guess how far he's like, Oh yeah, you're pregnant. I said, yeah, seven months. He's like, you're insane. Like I can't, I'm, and it just hit me. Like I'm bra- I'm breezing, I'm breezing these babies at these gates with my jockey friend, as if I'm a, you know, a jockey at 110, 15 pounds with, you know, a seven month old little, um, I'm seven months pregnant. And then going back and riding these show jumpers and training and going to horse shows. I had, you know. You're just doing, you're just in the moment <clears throat> doing what you have oh, to yeah. do to provide for the yes. family. And you're just doing it. And you're saying, hey, God, I hope you're looking out for me. I hope you're making I did. sure that I'm I safe. I looked up at God. So when you ride a racehorse in the morning and I have come, oh my gosh, I have come to terms with, with Jesus so many times. Well, with, with my ex, one, I mean, I, I know he's, I know he's real because I was getting the shit beat out of me, kicking me. Spit, and I heard Rory cry and like, I saw Jesus. Like I saw Jesus and at that moment, I know I'm jumping from story to story, but, um, this warmth came over me and it was like this Amber, kind of like your, your picture there. It it just was like this warmth and all the pain went away. The punching, the scaredness, the hitting, the kicking, the spit, everything. Like, I mean, I got treated like a dog on the ground, you know what I mean? And I was like, I'm never going to be in this situation again. One thing I want to talk about really quick, because throughout your story, there's been this extremely strong driven woman who knows she's capable of things, she's willing to put herself in a little bit of danger, even if she's not really considering the danger, you're a go-getter, but you fell into domestic abuse and domestic violence. I was never going to go back to it. That's what drove, that's what drove me, I think. Like, I was never going to not succeed because I was never going to be a, a victim ever, ever again. And my daughters, I would be darned if they saw their mother getting abused and thought that that was okay and then ended up with a guy like that. Because, and I don't hate him. Like, that's the, that's the, that's the, you know, hatred is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. And I don't hate the father of my, my children. I, I feel for him. I hope he finds peace. Well, it's because you're at a much later state in, state in life now. And like I said, there's that grace. But I'm terrified of him. You can look back though and say, that's a broken person. That's a person that's life's experiences have led him into being an unhealthy psychological human being. Like he's not well. Blaming everybody else. He's not well. Mm -hmm. The man needs serious help but you can see him as that instead of just seeing him as the action you understand the person behind the action right so one thing I was I was trying to get to there is like if you could talk to the 15 year old Gina or how many women are out there in the world they're gonna be going into relationships and things like that what advice or or how does it get to the point where there's violence in a relationship where someone is physically assaulting you, you know, how do you identify that earlier? Because you sit and you look from a much different lens now. You can right. look back and say, can tell you. you know what, there's some things that if if this Gina could go back in a time machine mm-hmm. and talk to the Gina before that relationship, I could say, hey, girl, these are things you need to monitor for. And Absolutely. if you see these things, your self-love, remember that selfishness? Yes. You putting yourself first has to trump whatever bullshit you tell yourself. Absolutely. Well, yeah, but he loves me or there's this and that. Mm-mm. What would you say to yourself? I would say not just trust your gut because your gut is is a habit, right? So people are like, oh, trust your gut. You have to look at a person and see what they're bringing to your life. If they're bringing you peace, if they're bringing you happiness, um, but true, like true value. What value does that person bring to you? And keep an eye out for those gaslighting qualities in people or, oh, you're, you're just so amazing. I love you so much. I can't live without you. I, you know, um, I, I'm so broken. I need you. But then they turn around and, and there's, there's just a lot of lying. Their, their actions don't match up with their words. Um, you're going to feel, left out and lonely at times, you know, um, and anger, watch them with other people, watch them with people that have been in their lives for a long time. Watch how they treat people how, who have been like their mom, their dad, because if someone's treating people like friends, if they treat other people shitty, how long is it going to take until you're that person? Because, you know, you're new in the relationship, so you're a new shiny little toy, and you're cool and pretty, and, you know, I want to, like, you get the ambassador, and people need to look out for ambassadors, because that's, with horses, you can't be an ambassador. You are what you are, and that's, I always, I know who I am, so 
just because you're a good person, don't expect that person that you're with to be a good person. Because I have done that my whole entire life. I'm like, I am loyal. I am trustworthy. Like I work hard and I expect you to be loyal and and trustworthy and work hard. And guess what? Next thing you turn around, you got black eyes and your rooster's shot. You know, sometimes you're trying to see the good in people, and your potential. You're, you know what it yeah. is? Your story of them, because you're like, oh, that's who they yes. are, is not the real truth. Mm-hmm. You have to objectively search for truth. And what you just said is extremely important. I tell a lot of people, <clears throat> listen, like the way you judge or the way you treat animals, I learned something about you from that. The way you treat a random stranger or someone that is significantly lower than you and like a social status or things or someone that can do nothing for you the way you treat that person tells me so much that I need to know about you Mm -hmm. because like you said you're in the honeymoon stage you're in the good stage of course they're going to try to put on the facade or wear a mask but if that's not really who they are that will slip with time you know what I mean and as that slips usually that's where anger and violence and things will come into play because now all of a sudden you're starting to be unhappy with the real person and now they have to confront that reality and they don't want to do that Mm -hmm. versus the random stranger that they scream at in traffic or the waiter that they tell to fuck off or whatever right right? they don't have to there's no accountability no accountability but with you there's going to be accountability yeah i'm very yeah (laughs) um i've tried to have accountability for myself and if i do something wrong i i'm I'm not perfect nowhere near perfect no one is but i'm gonna try and be better i'm gonna try and learn as much as i can with the with the information that's given me throughout the day and if if it's not given to me i'm gonna look for it you know i'm gonna educate myself So now to flip a chapter and to move towards, you know, all the stuff we're going to discuss about this weekend. So you've had a little bit of experience in broadcasting at this point. You've considered it. Almost. You're kind of like you dip your toe in the idea of. Once once I had the girls. So I had. um, You have two children. I have two children. So I was doing the I was doing what I could to survive for them, too. So I was in labor. And I had to feed 30 horses. So I called my doctor and I was like, you know, I knew I was going to, it was going to take a bit of time. So, um, I had a Lara in the hospital and they keep you for four days. Well, then the fourth day I get out, I start riding horses again. Like I'm on six, seven horses the next, after four days of having a baby. And so, um, you know, breastfeeding, riding, training, everything. Well, I just can't, I can't do the show life. I just can't do the people. I love horses. I'm a horsewoman. And so I um, went to Florida to show the horses, but then COVID hit. And the only thing during like the depression, the pandemic, the only thing that's open is sports because everything is shut down. So I started riding races again. And then I started like talking about it on my uh, Instagram and people really liked it. They were like, they loved my videos and they loved, you know, and I said, man, I really want to Um, open up the content for racing because it's such a closed industry and I love this industry and people should love it too. So that's what got me into that. Have you got away from that man that's with your children at that point? Have you completely separated or is there still some... Okay, I do want to say this to women out there. Look, you are not alone. There are so many women who go through this and it takes... Like I was... Like I was just blown away when I heard from the victim's advocate that it takes seven times for a woman or a man because it can go both ways to get away. And I was very lucky because, you know, he had patterns. So he would just, he would show up um, randomly and beat, like he, he, abu- he, he put his hands on me in public. And so I had gotten witness statements, video proof. Um, I mean, I have a video that the reason why I have, you know, full custody right now of my children almost for four years is because of the video proof that I have of him, you know, doing what he did. And it almost like I actually had to save it in my phone and listen to the words so that I didn't go back, James, even after all the, the abuse. The story in your head isn't real. Right. This is this reality. Is real. Yes. Gina, this is reality. Isn't Do that not crazy? ever go there again. I have I have sat on the couch and listened to the words that he said to me that he was going to break my neck and like that was the truth, not all the other yeah, yeah. but this yeah yes. but that Isn't no that insane? stop objective truth and that truth. video was a, maybe a great tool for you to say no it this me. is it reality was painful, but i had to listen to it and i had to move on and and that's why like i told you earlier i've, I've had a problem getting into jujitsu i love it but getting held down is very tough for me to overcome 
So, yeah. And objective truth is just so important. It is. People need to realize, like, the story that your brain wants to believe in, that's great. And maybe it's true. And maybe it's real. And hopefully those things. Mm -hmm. But you have to detach from that story as regularly as possible. And you have to objectively look at your life and your relationships. Your, you know, do people's words match their actions, match their energies. That's it, isn't it? Do people's words match their actions? 100%. And the more you get comfortable with truth even if it's an uncomfortable truth even if it's like oh i didn't want that story to be real we were supposed to be together forever this was supposed to happen or that the truth is what allows you to make the right decisions because you are like you know what it is unhealthy i have to step away from myself from my children from my future it's not yeah but this story says it's still possible Mm -mm. no no the truth is what matters yes so you're able to break out of that right you start separating and and the we're close on a timeline now. You're talking about yeah. the pandemic. That's two years ago. I know. So you've you've recently gone through getting out of this, and which is funny because I've seen a light in you only since I've met you get stronger and stronger and brighter and brighter and brighter. From the first time I met you at a I feel show, it. I feel I feel the warmth. To the woman that sits here today, I have seen a drastic improvement in your like radiance, in your ability to stand in your own power again. It's mm-hmm. like you've always known You're the right. woman that you are, but I've seen you right. coming back to yourself, which now, as I'm hearing your story, this makes perfect sense. You're mm-hmm. finally cutting out things that don't belong in your life. You're <clears> retaking <throat> your power. You're you're fixing your relationship with the truth. And yeah. now all of a sudden, it's going to start to bring out a better future. How do you get introduced to broadcasting and B2? Like, where does that come into so, the mix? So, yeah. So, um, I went back to Indiana because that's where I was an apprentice jockey. And I started racing. And, man, I was killing it. Like, I, I mean, killing it in a way of someone who doesn't have their bug, their apprentice. I don't have a 10-pound allowance anymore. I got, um, God sent me to this barn, Tony Granites. And I had, so, out of all of our horses that I rode for him, I never not hit the board. Third, second, first, always. Um, And so by doing that, it put me back in the professional athlete realm. And then I started doing some broadcasting with my friend Rachel, who is the um, Indian. Well, actually, it's actually horse something because Horseshoe Casino now. They bought it. They they got bought out. But um, so she does all the broadcasting. So she actually prepped me and showed me how to do things. We started doing some behind the silks, like behind the, you know, behind the silks because like anything's behind the silks, jockeys, goggle, like, you know, equipment, horses, anything, owners, trainers. It's very, it's a very big. So I was going to do a podcast um, and do behind the scene videos with jockeys, which I did. So we did like whipping it up Wednesday in the kitchen. Like what's jockeys kind of favorite m- meals, like Barbados food from like Rocco Bowen and all these awesome guys. Cause let me tell you them jockeys, I just adore the shit out of them. They're wonderful. Like we are, it's like being on a sports team. Like we all want each other to come home safe, but we're going to compete out there. And if we have horse, we have horse. So, um, and you've, you've found a love content creation oh, because yes. you, you, yes. you alluded to that earlier and I, you I found wanted to, content creation yes, and I wanted to, um, control the content because people have all this net. Like, look at the, like you, you type up the Kentucky Derby. It's all about Bob Baffert drugging Medina spirit. And really he had a tiny little, like it, it's like so blown out of proportion to get horse racing off the map, which is never going to happen. You're never going to stop horse racing. I don't, you're not going to do it. Um, so let's just put this positive, like, of course there's dark in the industry. There's dark in your, in in what we do. So that was my, my, um, my goal. And then, so I did a boxing for rough and rowdy and I, wait, you boxed or you were a broadcaster? I I boxed. Okay. So you were training a little bit. Yeah. So Peyton helped me, um, get ready for this rough and rowdy. And I really didn't train much. I like a couple out, you know, is there a video of this fight? Oh yes. B2 needs to post this at some point. Okay. So. I was Jockey Gina. I was like headlined and everything with Bad Ash. And I rode in. I am like, I'm the only boxer to ride to the boxing ring in a casino on a horse. You rode out (laughs) to your boxing match on a horse. Yeah. And this video is not posted regularly. I know. B2, listen, you have messed up tremendously. No, no. No, listen, tremendously. (laughs) There needs to be a video saying, do you want to see our broadcaster backstage before she joined our organization? This is the woman that will be interviewing you. And I want to see that video of you riding to a So I was Jockey Gina. I fought in my jockey boots. And they're like boxing boots like or shoes. Like they're kind of towed in and everything. I mean, it was so funny. So, um, yeah. So I rode into the casino on a racehorse. 
Now he was a, uh, a catch pony. So he was an old racehorse, but he caught like loose horses at the track. So I paid some money. They braided him up. They had the, I looked, put my jockey saddle on him, looked like a racehorse. And Dave is a big racing fan. So he was like, they didn't tell him what was happening, but like we had contingency plans with the casino in case something went down, you know? Well, you know what? This, you just, I rode him through the crowd. You just dropped some gold right now though. You understand how to make a spectacle. You understand how to Mm -hmm. really create something unique. Well, and I had to make money. So I had sponsors and I had my bra was sponsored. I had stuff that I was like doing social media wise. So that was like a $8,000 month for me with two kids, single woman, just being a professional athlete. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'll go in the boxing ring. I'm not scared. You know, I did point sparring when I was a kid, you know, I'm like, whatever. And I'm like, I know I got a good right hand on me. You know what I mean? So I, uh, yeah, I rode in on, on, on the horse. Um, Dave was like, we've got a horse in here. <laughs> and so I get in there and I box, uh, I box B- uh, bad ash and I lost by split decision, which was, you know, it's kind of normal hometown girl. Her, her coach was, you know, you know how it goes. It's cool. But after, um, I mean, I was like on fire. Like I didn't even want any water. They're like, what's wrong with this girl? She doesn't even want any water. And Peyton's cornering me and everything. And um, so it was an amazing. It was and just- I, I want you to realize this. Every single person in that crowd will never forget the Jockey moment Gina. that Jockey <clears throat> Gina That's what they said. rode a horse to the ring yeah. because you created a spectacle. You created something memorable. Oh, yeah. You came up with something that is original, that is impactful what is the entertainment business you know, dave was like is Lit- she a jockey here does she race here like what is what's going on right now literally the entertainment business is the ability to captivate an yeah. audience to make people want to know the the participants oh yeah chad engage- johnson messaged me and was like that's so cool i'm a jockey gina fan i'm like all right ocho <laughs> yeah uh, the football player yeah Oh, my God. So, like, that is how much of an impact that you made, yeah. right? And that's the idea of entertainment business. We are supposed to captivate people, yes. inspire people, invoke emotions mm-hmm. in people, right? So so you already have a natural recipe for understanding that. Even if you oh, didn't yeah. understand how genius that was now or at that point, looking back, that was yeah. genius. Oh, yeah. No, that. I did. I was like, I, ha- I paid money to do it, too. Like, I mean, they paid me to fight, and then I had my sponsors, but I knew that I had to pay out the horse and the trainer you know the you know the vet to make sure everything was safe so does a member of b2 see this and that's how you end up in no, b2 or- well okay so then um i go back to riding after that and i was like man i just love the entertainment world like i love boxing and everything um and then peyton was working on you know training more and getting you know so i was back in the gym because i had been kind of absent from the mma gym um, so for the people, we also have to frame this correctly because right. we've mentioned Peyton a couple times because he's sitting here with us today. Yeah. It's your husband, but we haven't framed how that relationship came into the mix. So basically, at some point in your comeback story after your children, you started training at an MMA gym. You met Peyton there. You developed a relationship. Right. Well, and now Peyton at this and I point- were friends for about six years prior. And so that's why, like, when Barstool Sports offered me the fight, I was like, "Who do I want in my corner? I'm a loner." And then I realized, like, oh, shit, like, my one of my closest friends who we don't, like, you can have a really close friend and not talk to them for a while, you know. But Peyton knew the father of my children, so that's how we knew each other six years ago, and we were friends. And he saw the, tra- like, he saw the turmoil I went through. He saw, like, he saw everything firsthand sometimes. He even saw it, like, he saw it. And so I called him up, and I was like, yo, P, I got this boxing match. Uh, I'm going to need you to, like, I don't know, I want you in my corner. And then after, like, a few weeks after the fight, we kind of just, like, we're, like, well, there's no ambassador at that point because I already, I've known him for six years. I kind of know his turmoil. He knows my turmoil. We're, like, let's, we're we're freaking best friends, you know, at this point. And, like, you're, you're my guy. Like, you're my big man. I call him my Neanderthal. You know, he's my big Sasquatch. And so, uh, you know, he, uh, (laughs) stop it. Um, yeah, so then um, I got back in the MMA gym, and I'm like, so, you know, me, I'm a professional athlete, so I'm like, you are so talented. You, like, start, get back into the gym and train. Like, well, let's do this. I support you. I Like, I'll, you can train 10 hours a day, and I'll, I'll be home making dinner. I will meal prep for you. Like, I'm in it to win it, you know? And so it was great to just have that vibe with someone because he's a dreamer. He's a hard worker. I've never met someone 
who has just overcome so many obstacles and still has demons, of course, like us all that we're still trying to overcome, but just keeps thriving and pushing forward. So this probably reinvigorates your life dramatically. It, it oh, brings absolutely. so much new energy and yes. passion oh, and motivation. Sure. So now where do we find B2? Okay. So I go to, um, one of my jockey friends is doing insurance for UFC fighters. So I go down to Texas for the UFC when Derek Lewis was fighting. So we go down to Bob's gym, Bob Perez, and, um, I'm like going to do interviews with fighters. Now we had a friend fighting for B2 and I was like, you know what? We'll go to Texas. We'll do a little road trip and we go to B2. And I talked to Chris, uh, the director of social media now, or really the director of all the content so he um I said Chris like do you mind if I interview your fighters because I'm doing a podcast and content and he's like yeah he's like but we've been wanting this for a really long time and I was like well I mean I'm here so then I spoke with Greg and uh, Mr. Bell put me in position to you know start doing post-fight interviews with the fighters when did that start when did it happen that you That's actually came on board with B2 started August of last year so, yeah, this is incredibly very recent. New. I mean, this is about seven months ago. Yes. Because and now you're already like a face for B2. Like when people are thinking of B2 fighting series, they know you. They know Gina LaSeal. Like yeah. you've, you guys have been I'm branded so together extremely I, well. I just have to say I am just so incredibly blown away by B2 fighting series. And it's not just like it's the whole family community. It's the community of the – like. Vanessa and Higdon, like, they have done just an amazing fighter relationship. I mean, I, I was at Hard Rock MMA, so I've known Brand, Brandon for a long time. And probably about seven years before I even met Peyton. So I was at Hard Rock MMA, and then I've just seen them. And Vanessa's, like, an amazing businesswoman. I mean, she, you know, she fought. She's an athlete. She modeled. She's just I really look up to her as a as like an entrepreneur and just a businesswoman. And so working with them and then Greg is just a he's a genius. Like you know, they have B2 Digital and then Fighting Series is the content and it's like the the business lineup is just it blo it's mind blowing because I'm actually now seeing it done right. I'm seeing business done right, which I've seen a lot of entrepreneurial stuff just not done right, not be organized. And it's um, the dynamic of it is just like I invest in it because it's amazing. I invest my time, my heart, my spirit. And um, yeah, so to be brought on as one of the crew with Alex and Andy, I'm very humbled. So one of the things you and I were talking about right before this podcast, I kind of vouch for B2, and I'm going to vouch yes. for them again on the on the uh, podcast, is I had gone, I go to leagues all over the world, all over the country. I've been to like the best of the best, and I've been to kind of the bottom of the barrel. And the first time I ever went to a B2 show, it was in Lexington, Kentucky, and I had just come off of a terrible show that I had gone to. I'm not even going to say where it was or anything because I don't want to, I don't dog on people, but... Right. I just went to a show that like the caliber was so unbelievably low. Everything was so unprofessional. There was, it was Yikes. just, it's bottom of the barrel. So then I was going down to, I'm like, oh God, now I'm off to Lexington, Kentucky, Kentucky. with B2 fighting series. I've never heard of them in my life. Like who knows? But like, you know what? I give everyone a shot because I don't judge a book by its cover. I could be blown away from the moment that I met and worked with the staff of B2. I was like, these people are something different. There's something different here. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it right away, but I saw like each member is convicted or like committed to the cause. They are genuinely, they are not just employees doing a basic job that are like, they are bought in. They're like, listen, we are yes. a part of something special. We are a team that is going to build something memorable. And so I went and I had an incredible performance or an incredible experience, experience the first time I was there. I was like, you know, we, we had an incredible performance too. So, which helped because they saw our fighter yes. went really well. They saw the dynamics that I have with my team. So I think there was like, they had respect for us and we had respect for them. And then I was like, man, like when I came back to Michigan, I was actually talking to a bunch of my coaches here about it. Um, and I'm like, dude, like these guys are. I don't know. I was they like, I was like, I think I'm going to put a couple more people on their list. So then I sent Brandon like, like four people or five people's names. And then he booked almost all of them. And I went like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Generally you expect to get one or two. So then I go to the next show and this is what I wanted to talk about on the podcast. There was a drastic improvement from that great experience that I just had to an, an, the next show, which was only like six weeks later. Yes. And I go, 
these people are completely evolving in a six game. week period. Uh, yes. They are drastically better. Yes. And now, um, from the first experience I've ever had to be to, to like the most recent, it is unrecognizable from where they were Isn't that it? I was happy with initially. Right. It is that much of, of a profound improvement. And I, I don't even know what you have in store for Saturday, oh, but one of the things you said to me is like, listen, we are going to be at an entirely new level on Saturday. It's so, mind-blowing for me, and I work for the company. Like, so I here, show up to work, and I'm like, I love my job. I have never, like I, in my, like, I didn't think I could love something so much other than horse racing. So this is what I want to try to do for B2. I want you, as a member of the culture and as a member of the community, try to describe to our listeners why is B2 special and how is it that they are absolutely becoming a gold standard for a national league? You have an inside scoop. Gina, give us the inside scoop. The heart. It comes with heart and it comes with a lot of educated people that just truly like MMA is not their job. It's their life. And when something becomes your life, it is just, it flourishes and it never, it just never stops. I mean, I have never been around. I, The racetrack, they work hard. B2, everybody at B2 is working so hard. And I love it because there's no one slacking. No one is not pulling their weight or picking up their, what they're supposed to do. And then, and then some. And it's like, like Rob Mooney works so hard. Alex and Andy work so hard. Vanessa works so hard. And Paul, I mean, and Bre- Brendan. And I mean, everybody. Um, the crew, it goes down from the, the roadies to the town. Like Lance. Lance Green never stops improving his show. He's and on my you're going to have tomorrow. him tomorrow. He's so excited to be here. And I just like, man, he he is like, he wants to perfect his his talent and everybody just wants the show to be better. And they I never see anyone sitting down. No one's ever sitting down. Vanessa's involved in everything, but she's like she's a fighter, she's a businesswoman, she knows like the enter and she puts she's an amazing like she manages people wonderfully because she puts people where they're supposed to be. And she knows what they can do and then she gives them a little extra as a challenge. And then she'll give you more of a challenge, which is so refreshing, you know. So here's the massive question. How have the right people all come together to create that culture? Because like, just like we were talking about before the podcast, Mr. Again, Bell. I was going to say, gonna say Mr. that's Bell. what I was expecting. And I was going to bring him up last week. Leadership like, is everything. Yeah. So what is Mr. it Bell. that Mr. Bell has done? That is because it sounds like you have an incredible team. You have passion. Mm-hmm. You have energy. You have commitment. You have conviction. You have all these things. But that had to come from someone pulling the strings in the right yes. way. How has Greg, Mr. Bell, brought together such a diverse group of people to have such an incredible culture? What is it about him or about his processes that has created the culture? You know, Greg is, is, is um, you know, you can sit down with him and he'll tell you about his vision, but you're not going to understand it because you've never been there. You've never seen it, you know? So it's very hard for me because I take, I take this job day by day, like, or, you know, because there's always something new. There's always something going on. Like, like I say with Vanessa being great at putting people in their proper spots where they're going to shine and make the show shine and make it shine for the fighters and the trainers and everybody. Um, Greg does that with the, with the beat to fighting series. You know, he's put everybody where they're supposed to be. He, you know, I, from what I could see, he was always there making sure that there was systems in place like you do with your fighters on the cage. If this doesn't work, you go to this. If this doesn't, everybody knows Everybody knows their job. Everybody has a set standard, you know, and, and, you know, you exceed the set standard and the passion behind it. And then now we have a new production team. So the broadcast is, is I haven't even seen the, the, bro- I was going to actually look at it today when, once I'm doing my homework for the fighters and stuff, but like, it's just, it's blown up. I so Greg is like the architect. He has the vision. He has the dream. He has the, the he sees the direction that we have to go. And he's, he's able to dream and imagine and create, right? Yes. And he's the architect that says, these are the people that I need to find to build or bring this thing to life. And it's worked out outstanding. Yes. Like, like I said, for anyone that hasn't been to a B2 fighting series show, go. 
don't take my word for it. Don't take Gina's word for it. Go experience it experience for yourself. It. Experience it. And at the it's end, it's like going to a UFC show without having to go through the lines, sit in the big stadium in the nosebleed seats. Like you are getting top. I mean, it is the premier developmental league for MMA. We have the top amateurs, we have top professionals, and we're just, they're killing it. And I am just like, I'm so, so thankful and so happy to be able to sit down with or stand with a fighter and show the audience who they are as a person rather than just who they are as a mixed martial artist because it takes so much dedication, time, heartbreak, heartache, you know, a strain on your family, like to get where you get when you see people on these big shows like UFC and LFA, you know what I mean? Like Bellator, PFL, all the, all the big shows, like they have to start somewhere. So for me also to, because, you know, you have to be an athlete, a fighter and an entertainer. I was never a fighter, but I'm an athlete and I'm an entertainer. So I know those two aspects of it. You know, and I respect the fighters. I would never like now I would I would have loved to fight. I would have loved to be an MMA fighter. Um, but I'm here. My purpose is to show them and kind of guide them with proper questions, help them get in front of the camera, make them comfortable, you know, be their friend on a certain like on a certain level and uh, give them an opportunity to to showcase who they are as a person. So then that helps for endorse like for, you know, endorsements, sponsorships you know, that's, that's important because as a fighter, you have to train 24 seven fighting is your job. Like being a jockey is your job. I cut weight for a living anorexic, bulimic, you name it. I went through it to be a jockey. I ran a hundred miles in a week, seven days to be a jockey, to keep my weight down, to stay fit, keep my cardio up. Like be, you know, being a fighter, it's almost 10 times harder. And that's something that everybody should Total take advice combat. from. Listen, if you're going to do something and you actually want to be successful, don't you don't say you want to be successful. You don't post it. You want to be if you actually want to be successful, you have to learn how to go you all have to in. do it. You have to learn how to do it all like out. the best in the world do it. And you feel like you're like, OK, I have you, you know, you, you think you hit a base and then you find more. That's empowering. That empowered me to be as strong as I am today. And, and I'm, I'm not even as strong as I could be. I'm just throwing. That's one of the biggest things I think that has made me successful as a man is what I constantly do is I get to a level and as soon as I'm there, whatever level it is in any part of my life, whether it's it's relationships, it's business, anything, as soon as I get that level, I don't like that level anymore. Right. I want to say, what's the more. next level then? In if a I healthy can, way. In yeah, a in a healthy way. way. Yeah. But if I started here and I didn't even know if it was possible for me to reach this level and then I get there, well, then what about the person that's sitting here? I just make this my base again and I say, yes. Can I reach this level now? Yes. Can I? And that makes life fun. It makes life challenging. We it have makes one life, life invigorating. James. 100%. Everybody out here needs to realize that they you don't even know when your last day is. That's And the more greatness that you pull out of yourself, the more you will impact the people around, around you yeah, with that greatness. Others. So if you want to change the world, you want to change the community, you want to change your family, or you want to, you just want to be a light for people, then you have a responsibility that you need to find that greatness and you need to bring it out. And it's necessary for you to do so. If you don't do so and you dim your light for other people's comfort mm -hmm. or all the things we've discussed on this podcast, you are doing a disservice not only to yourself, people but to every you. single person you will encounter for the rest of your life because they deserve the best version of you and so do you. Yes. You just are responsible for achieving it, not them. So I guess the final thing we'll say, we've done an hour and a half, by the way. We've done a feature film. Feature okay, film. The way we're going to wrap up this podcast is if you could send a message to the fans on why, why they should be there on Saturday night in Novi, Michigan. Why is it that B2 coming to Michigan is something special? Because this is the first time you guys have ever come to Michigan. I know. I'm and so... I let understand. Let me tell you what. I understand what B2 is. The crew and me, is. we have been... I mean, I came up here early because I wanted to come and see Novi. I wanted to come and see your gym. You guys are just so... Just a breath of fresh air. Your system's in place, your culture, and now just seeing your facility, it's... It's, it's just, it's the way it should be done. It's refreshing because a lot in life right now is not refreshing. A lot of people are tearing people down, not bringing, you know, humanity into things. And we need to come back to that. We need to be, we need to be, we need to discuss things. We need to do this. Um, man, th there's nowhere else to be on Saturday night than at the fights. There's nowhere else to be. 
There's no bar that's going to give you the enjoyment. There's no movie that's going to give you the excitement. There's no there's no air that's going to smell like real air than in that stadium on Saturday night for B2 Fighting Series in Novi, Michigan. I love it. I love yes, it. Yes, baby. You know what? It's the experience. Yes. You will feel alive in that moment, and you will witness passion. You will witness real human struggle. Yes, and you're also going to be brought back to, like, the gladiator days. When you hear that that canvas hit, Oh man! And you got Lance Green Whoa. just and Lance getting the Green people getting going it down. He's getting oh my gosh! It's and and like the sh- oh my gosh! You, there's just nowhere else to be. There's nowhere else to be Saturday night in Novi, Michigan. I'm gonna clip this, and this is, will probably go up tonight before the whole podcast is available because like that's what I want to say to people. But I want them to see it from a bunch of people. Like, once you experience this type of energy and passion live, you just desire to be around yes. it again because that type of energy spills into your life. If you want to change your life, you. surround yourself with motivated people. Surround yourself with energetic people. Surround yeah. yourself with the dreamers and the go-getters and the people that want to throw you a rope and pick you. Come on with us. We're doing some cool shit. Yeah. We're doing some cool shit. We're doing some cool shit, man. Oh, man. So, Gina, it was a pleasure sitting with you today. It was wonderful getting to know your story. I feel like I know you so much more as a human being now. I look forward to your growth within B2. I look forward to SFS and B2 having an intimate relationship where constantly we're sending athletes and dreamers and we're being a part of a league that is also dreamers and and people chasing greatness. So together, I think both things will grow to the top. They'll grow to their fullest potential. And it's going to be an incredible ride. It's going to be an incredible ride, okay? It's going to be an incredible ride. You did. Thank you, James, so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too.